We are completing our look at the three places Godhead appears in the King James Bible. So far, the uses have not been able to bear the definition of Godhead, which is insisted upon by Denlinger, and in this last place, that is still the case. Denlinger's definition cannot work, since Godhead to him refers to the union of all three parts, and here all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in Christ. This would mean all three parts are in Christ bodily, and you can't have a full, developed body in another body. Again, Bedag gives us the state of being God, divine character or nature, deity, divinity, used as abstract noun for theos, the fullness of deity. Now, from Plutarch's Moralia, Why the Oracle Ceased to Give Answers, section 415b, so from humans into heroes and from heroes into demigods, the better souls undergo their transition, and from demigods, a few, after a long period of purification, share totally in divinity. From Origen Contra Celsus, Book 2, Chapter 36. But if this Celsus, who, in order to find matter of accusation against Jesus and the Christians, extracts from the gospel even passages which are incorrectly interpreted, but passes over in silence the evidences of the divinity of Jesus, would listen to divine portents, let him read the gospel, and see that even the centurion and they who with him kept watch over Jesus, on seeing the earthquake and the events that occurred, were greatly afraid, saying, This man was the Son of God. From Book 7, Chapter 25. But as there is reason to believe that Celsus produces the objections which he has heard from those who wish to make a difference between the God of the gospel and the God of the law, we must say in reply that this precept, whosoever shall strike thee on the one cheek, turn to him the other, is not unknown in the older scriptures. From the shepherd of Hermas, this is commandment 10, Listen, he said, those who have never searched for the truth or inquired about the deity, but have simply believed and have been entangled in business affairs and wealth and friendships with outsiders and many other concerns of this world, well, those who are absorbed in these things do not comprehend the divine parables because they are darkened by these matters and are ruined and become barren. Just as good vineyards are made barren by thorns and weeds of various kinds when they are neglected, so people who have believed and then fall into these many activities that have been mentioned above lose their understanding and do not comprehend anything at all concerning righteousness. For whenever they hear about divine matters and truth, their mind is preoccupied with their own affairs and they understand nothing at all. But those who fear God and inquire about divine matters and truth and direct their heart to the Lord grasp more quickly and understand everything that is said to them because they have the fear of the Lord in themselves. For where the Lord lives, there also is much understanding. So hold fast to the Lord and you will understand and grasp everything. From Commandment 11. For no spirit given by God needs to be consulted. Instead, having the divine power, it speaks everything on its own initiative because it is from above, from the power of the divine spirit. In this way, then, the divine spirit will be obvious. Such, therefore, is the power of discernment with respect to the divine spirit of the Lord. But when he does come to an assembly full of righteous people who have a divine spirit, an intercession is made by them. That person is emptied, and the earthly spirit flees from him in fear, and that person is rendered speechless and is completely shattered, unable to say a thing. In this epistle, Paul is writing to the Colossian Christians to address a heresy that has gained a foothold among them. Lightfoot notes that the purity of their Christianity is endangered by two errors recommended to them by their heretical leaders, the one theological, the other practical, but both alike springing from the same source, the conception of matter as the origin and abode of evil. Thus, regarding God and matter as directly antagonistic, and therefore apart from, and having no communication with each other, they sought to explain the creation and government of the world by interposing a series of intermediate beings, emanations or angels, to whom accordingly they offered worship. At the same time, since they held that evil resided not in the rebellious spirit of man, but in the innate properties of matter, they sought to overcome it by a rigid ascetic discipline, which failed, after all, to touch the springs of action. As both errors flowed from the same source, they must be corrected by the application of the same remedy, the Christ of the gospel. In the person of Christ, the one mediator between heaven and earth is the true solution of the theological difficulty. Through the life in Christ, the purification of the heart through faith and love is the effectual triumph over moral evil. 
St. Paul, therefore, prescribes to the Colossians the true teaching of the gospel as the best antidote to the twofold danger which threatens at once their theological creed and their moral principles, while at the same time he enforces his lesson by the claims of personal affection, appealing to the devotion of their evangelist Epiphas on their behalf. And to quickly touch on the highlights of this passage and reflect on the theological ramifications, in chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says he gives thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, mentioning two subjects here, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 9, Paul says he does not cease to pray for the Colossians and desires that they would be filled with knowledge of God's will, to the end that, in verse 10, they would walk worthy of the Lord, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in knowledge of God, strengthened in all might unto all patience and long suffering, giving thanks unto the Father, who has made them meet to be partakers of the inheritance, has delivered them from the power of darkness, and has translated them into the kingdom of his dear Son. We still have two being referred to, the Father and the Son. It is in the Son that we have redemption. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. By him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. It pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and to reconcile all things to himself through the blood of the Son's cross. In chapter 2, verse 2b, into verse 3, Christ is he in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And Paul says this, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. In 2.8, Paul exhorts them to beware, lest any man spoils them through philosophy and vain deceit, which commentators have noted is an apposition, or that since the preposition and article are not repeated, a single means, a category, is here presented. Not philosophy in general, but what they called such, which was vain deceit. He goes on to further specify the philosophy he is warning against, one based not upon Christ, but the ideas or traditions of man and the elements of the world. Why is Christ better than these rudimentary ideas? But Paul, echoing a term the heretical teachers were using, fullness, makes one of the clear statements in the New Testament of the deity of Christ. In the incarnate Jesus is found the fullness of deity. Elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus is clearly referred to as God, John 1.14 and 1 Timothy 3.16. So this is not a mere man overshadowed or filled with the Spirit. Continuing, it's clear, since this is the case, that believers are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power, which were earlier stated to have been created by Him. It's said that Christ is Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. These principalities and power, roughly corresponding to the traditions of men and rudiments of the world, were one, created by Jesus Christ, two, ruled by Jesus Christ, and three, spoiled by Jesus Christ or disarmed by him. The demonic power behind the angels or astral bodies or behind the teaching tempting the Colossians to observe law has been overcome in Christ's death and resurrection. In light of Christ's nature, his position or office, the result of his death and resurrection, and the union of the believer with Christ through faith in his triumph over all these, Paul gives a practical, negative exhortation to the Colossians. Let no man, one, judge you regarding things which are shadows of that which has come, Christ. Two, let no man beguile you of your reward by distracting and drawing your attention away to voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, etc., which constitutes letting go of the head, which again is Christ, by whom the whole body is ministered, nourished, knit together, and increases with the increase of God, or that increase which comes from God's grace. Of course, the epistle continues with more exhortations and instructions for believers in their various earthly relations and positions. But Paul does not give us a gospel hope in a part of God or a body. We are given life, hope, deliverance, and freedom in the person and work of Christ, in whom the fullness of the Godhead, the one true deity, dwells bodily. Not a portion or certain aspects of the deity, but the fullness. And since through that fullness in Jesus Christ we have peace with God and communion with Him by faith in the Son, 
these earthly rudiments and false piety and other mediators are faulty, incomplete, and turning to them constitutes not holding to the head, who is before all things and in whom all things consist, Christ Jesus. Having examined the three occurrences of Godhead in the King James Bible, it should be clear that the meaning they ascribe to the word is certainly not present in the original language words, the historical meaning of the English word, nor can it be borne out in exegesis of the text in which it is found in the King James Bible. Their meaning is assumed and imported into these texts. The proof of their doctrine cannot rest upon these three verses. It must be demonstrated elsewhere.